Okay. To be sophisticated consumers of modern political science analysis, as well as producers of said analysis, I wanted to highlight several um, challenges to analyzing group level uh, data. And I, I want to focus on three specifically. How connected our concepts and measures are, something that connects to our discussion in week four, the ecological fallacy, and then the difficulty and the unstated assumptions in creating indicators of measures that we care about. So let's start with the concept and measure connection. It should be something that hopefully you've already thought about for your own particular topics and for your problem statements, as well as for your final essay. But it's, it's, it's important to kind of stress the importance of matching the concept and the measurement as closely as possible, most basically just at the level of, uh, of analysis that you have of your theory, whether it's at the country, the state, or the individual, to the concept that we're studying. And it's often easy to forget that um, you, your argument might be at the individual level, but then you end up using state-level data. That can cause a lot of uh, problems. Usually it's the reverse, um, but when we have different, uh, different types of concepts and measures, this table come, is from the, the presentation I'm giving at the conference uh, today, in a little bit, I need to finish these videos, of uh, election violence. And the concept of election violence, you would think would be pretty simple, that it is people using violence during the election process to try to shape the outcome. But a lot of people have different conceptualizations of who the actors are, is it the government, is it the opposition? They have different uh, assumptions about um, in space and time, is the violence relevant before the election or after the election? Uh, so you want to make sure your data are matched to your theory. If your argument is about government repression before the election, then you want to choose the data that focus on that. And what I'm trying to do with my own analysis is to try to use latent variable analysis to try to, to pool all these data and try to use all the information from all the different observations to try to tease out the latent risk of election violence. And that, I think, will come closer to what people have done in the past with all these different data sources for using measures that might be at the election level, but they're really talking about the election month or the actual election event. So try to, to tease out through using as much data as possible that latent relationship between the risk of violence and absolute, um, actual violence. Let's see if I can finish uh, talking before I lose my voice. The next thing is uh, ecological fallacy is a challenge when using aggregate level data. An ecological inference is an inference about individual behavior drawn from data about aggregates. This is something Gary King at Harvard wrote an entire book about how to do. However, it's often easy to fall a victim to the ecological fallacy instead of actually uh, conducting the analysis in a way that you can connect um, group level data to individual behavior. However, more, more likely what people end up doing is thinking that relationships observed for groups necessarily work uh, for individuals. An example of that would be um, uh, the Robinson uh, d uh, article that I took out from the reading for this week um, about whether uh, the relationship between being born abroad and literacy, we're likely to not have individual uh, data unless you have potentially uh, census uh, data on at, not at the individual level but at the group level. And so let's say, like with the Robinson data, that there's a positive correlation at the aggregate level. That doesn't mean that we can say, so the positive relationship, that if you are foreign-born, you're more likely to be able to have high literacy rates. That doesn't say anything about the individuals within those, uh, within those areas. And because the aggregate um, group-level data, let's say at the state level, would be positive, um, between the foreign-born population and the literacy population, the Robinson article is basically making the argument that immigrants are more likely to go to the more urban coastal areas in which you have uh, more foreign-born populations as well as higher levels of economic development and hence higher literacy rates. Those literacy rates aren't about the uh, foreign-born population because they're a relatively uh, small percentage. 
It's about the uh, the native born population, but you make an ecological fallacy looking at without controlling or understanding what happens at the individual level statements about the aggregate level and trying to draw correlations between that and individual levels. Uh, it's tough to try to think about. It's often thinking, uh, it's useful to think about at your own group level uh, data that you're interested in. The other, um, the other factor I wanted to highlight when with group level data is not something that you really will focus on with generating your own data for your own papers, but in being consumers of data, often will rely on indicators. And uh, ideally, we'd have those raw data, like the event data for election violence that I mentioned earlier, but often we'll have additive indices, like those perceptions of election integrity that I used for my article a bit earlier, uh, or multiplicative uh, indices, ones in which you have uh, certain factors mattering more, or you need to have all factors below it in order to reach higher uh, different scales. Um, it's important to understand how your indicator was created. And uh, for last week, as well as in previous weeks, I had the cor uh, Corruption Perception Index as well as Polity. These are two indices that have a lot of issues that people have highlighted over time in their opaqueness or their reliance on some important assumptions about um, uh, comparability for the cor uh, Corruption Perception Index. There's often a question about whether this is actually comparable across time or across space. Transparency International actually says you shouldn't pool the data before 2012 and after because they changed their methodology so that a score of 85 in 2010 isn't the same intensity uh, as in uh, 2015. Often people don't read the methodology or the code book to be able to understand these differences. So be aware of the difference between using the raw data, like um, uh, uh, GDP, uh, or the number of people within a state, and these kind of more, um, uh, not necessarily cooked, but transformed uh, data. You can also think about uh, transforming your raw data to try to make sure that you don't have a few extreme values skewing your results um, by, for example, using the natural log. This is often the case when looking at population and gross domestic product. You have a few countries like India and China that have over a billion uh, people. The vast majority of states don't have anywhere near that. So if you put in the raw population data in your regression, those few states, uh, the really large ones like the US and uh, Indonesia, or Russia, China and India, you might get a different result than if you transform it to make it more like that normal curve, which is what the regression assumes the nature of your data are. Uh, or uh, if you do those histograms, like I suggested a bit earlier, and you see your data are quite, quite skewed, it is easy in Excel or in R or Stata or other softwares to transform your data to make those outliers have less of an effect on your outcomes. Standardization for your factors is also another way you can transform it by using the log, which smooths out the distribution. You could also standardize it. So let's say um, number of pizzas consumed per capita would tell us more than the number of pizzas consumed in a state because a state with a billion people are likely to consume more people, all else being equal, et cetera, paribus, than a state with 100,000 people. Or if you're looking at some economic variable, you maybe want to control it as a percentage of GDP. So people look at government spending, instead of just looking at the pure dollars of government spending on healthcare or education or, for, uh, or so forth. But if you scale it as a percentage of GDP or the total government budget, that might meet, give you a more meaningful indicator for how much a government cares or is spending about a specific issue that you're looking at. So there's a lot of ways at trying to create indicators, use raw indicators, or transform them to better connect to your theory is the takeaway that I want I'm trying to say. And often, the more measures you have, the better. Or if you have a relationship and you, you include indicators from one source, like Polity, and then you include another one from VDEM, if they both tell you the same thing, then you, you have a greater confidence that your evidence is capturing that relationship you have uh, made theoretically in your paper.
So the more robust your, your results are to transformation or standardization or using different indices, the more confident you can have in your evidence and your ability to reject the null hypothesis that there, no, there is no relationship between those two different cases. And so, yeah, that's why I spent all this time gathering all these different data on election violence to have increased confidence in my aggregate level analysis. Finding good data is also a challenge. It is, it is as much of an art as a science. It can be accidental. It can be knowing where to look for the different sources. Um, Varieties of Democracy has over 300 indicators. They're a natural first step. Quality of Governance um, Institute in Sweden also has a whole bunch of different measures they gathered from a different sources. Um, always welcome to reach out to us via email or office hours. Um, check the different sources uh, that I mentioned earlier. Hopefully it would give you an idea for where to look at for data sources for your final. Um, and also you have to think about how the data are generated. Um, they could be as much of a function of state capacity. There's a really interesting article by Hollier et al that looked at how many data points were reported by different countries to the World Bank as a measure of transparency, as well as a function of state capacity. Governments that don't have state capacity or recently um, emerged from conflict don't necessarily have the same amount of capacity to gather data about their own populations and countries that are, are developed. Uh, I also have noticed with um, international Environmental uh, conferences, for other classes that I teach, you have larger countries like the U.S. sending 20, 200 representatives to a conference, while smaller countries might only have the capacity to have one or two. And those countries with larger capacity, larger amounts of people are more likely to have influence in the final outcome. Same thing with statistics. Another thing is you require political stability. Um, Ken Schultz uh, and uh, Macon wrote a really interesting article looking at um, temperature uh, stations in Africa because there's a really influential article in 2004 in which, you know, those hurdles of causality that I talked about before, that the relationship isn't endogenous. One way to try to make sure is by including outside factors. Um, uh, Ed Miguel and others had an article looking at uh, rainfall as an exogenous predictor of economic growth that doesn't cause conflict to be able to say, okay, in this relationship between X and Y, I have this uh, other factor, rainfall, that affects one factor but not the other, so it can anchor with cri that criterion validity concern that we mentioned earlier to really show how um, economic growth has um, a separate effect on conflict. Ken Schultz and Justin Mencken came on uh, along over a decade later and said, actually, where you can gather data on rainfall is not equal across the, the continent. You have different areas like the Democratic Republic of Congo in the middle of this map that has virtually no uh, temperature sensors because of capacity concerns and political instability for the last 20 years. Satellite data uh, 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 deals with some of these concerns, but the data that the original analysis was using wasn't including that. And so thinking about how your data were generated, the potential outside factors that could shape the values or whether these values are measured at all are important when trying to deal with aggregate level data. One final factor uh, for aggregate data, we often assume that uh, observations are independent uh, from each other, but there's often clustering. I've shown you maps in this class that show that democracy, economic development often cluster in different regions. Um, violence also uh, clusters in regions connecting to the map beforehand. So when we think about our analysis, we want to think about whether the data that we're using from one row could actually affect the other um, the other cells. You're not gonna. I'm not expecting you in your papers to do anything about it, but just highlight it as a potential risk, something to talk about in your analysis as to whether these things are related um, for these kind of neighborhood effects from, from corruption to a recent, another recent paper that I looked at, freedom of foreign movement, countries that can make it easier or harder for their citizens to move abroad, hmm, seems relevant to 
what Russia is going through now in limiting, as of today or tomorrow, the ability of um, co- uh, people, uh, males that are between the age of like 18 and 69 to be able to leave the country. To what extent there are neighborhood effects of these kind of policies, either in in encouraging freedom of foreign movement, like with the Schengen area in Europe, or the opposite way in some uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa, or in the opposite direction in Latin America. So just think about your data, think about how they might cluster in time or in space. Um, important takeaways, make sure that we are, are gathering data at the same level as our theory, try to reduce the risk of e- uh, ecological inference or ecological fallacies by using data at one level and then making conclusions at a different level and think about how our indicators are created and used and the potential for uh, trans- the usefulness of transforming or standardizing these measures and trying to use as many measures as we ha- can to make sure that we're actually reducing that risk of, um, of type one and type two errors. So with that, I'll connect uh, it at the end of today with a, a couple of quick tips for the assessment for this class.